That's Red Mountain, where Nancy Green learned to ski. The mines up there built towns like Rossland and Warfield in the interior of B.C. and the city of Spokane in Washington. And down there in the valley, in the smoke, they spawned a company town called Trail B.C. Phil's a funny place. I don't consider we're a company town in the traditional sense. To me, Cominco is the most valuable thing to trail and to my life and to the welfare of my family, and I'm sure it applies to the majority of the people around. It's possible that you're in a better position if you're completely a company town than being a half-assed company town, which we are. Where are you going, company town? Where are you going to today? Where are you going, company town? Where are you going to today? In the 1890s, they shipped ore from trail 15 miles down the Columbia for processing in the States. Then a copper smelter went up. The CPR bought it in 1897 and established Consolidated Mining and Smelting, Cominco. By the 1930s, trail was prospering under the paternalistic eyes of H.G. Blaylock. But the way it's been changing lately, Blaylock must be spinning in his grave. Cominco is no longer the paternalistic father that they once were. There's a revolution going on in this town. Oh, oh. very nice. Hurry. Marv McLean, president of the 2,800-member steelworker local in Trail. The Chamber of Commerce in this town is just about as difficult to fight as Cominco. Well, the, you know? prob the problem with the whole town is the same as with the company, that you don't have any working guys in any of the uh, uh, city council or the hospital board or school board. It's all the goddamn management type, you know? It's no good. We got to get the working guy. So the working guy can get some benefits out of the company and out of the town. We got some good guys, some good young guys, bright young guys who are gonna. They're eventually gonna do a good job in this town. I think this thing will help this town. Most people remember the company story, Turkey at Christmas time. They forget about the goose every time they bargain. Most of the older guys have some loyalty to whiskey, where we have none. Where are you going, company town? Where are you going to today? Where are you going, company town? Where are you going to today? Well, sometimes I walk around the company town and I can't see the sky for the company clouds. Smoke keeps pouring out from up on the hill and the town looks deadly and looks to kill. They really expect anybody who talks about the trail to talk about trail as the trail smoke eaters and what a good town it is. Many you bring up that there's some smoke coming out of the stacks up there and the horses are dying on the mountainside. Everybody knows it. Everybody reads it in the newspapers, but they hate for it to go outside of the town. Smokestacks are a trail symbol. Even the hockey team is called the smoke eaters. It's a company town, but it's not typical. The company never owned all the houses. But Trail still has all its eggs in one basket, even if a multinational Cominco no longer has all its eggs in Trail. Independent merchant, Al Tognati. Actually, I personally, my own idea, we need Cominco. And sometimes it even scares me to think that they, you know, they, we say, oh, Cominco pull out or this and that. Can you imagine if something like that happened? There's nothing here in the West Kootenai area. There is maybe a little bit of lumbering, but that's all. We all know that not only trail, the whole area is dependent on Cominco. Without Cominco, there wouldn't probably be a, be a West Kootenai. So it's Cominco that is keeping us all alive. The Cominco plant in trail is almost a city in itself. 4,000 people work here. 90% of the workforce in seven towns in the area. 80% of the economy depends on Cominco. Dozens of different products are produced, but lead and zinc are the mainstays. In the 1930s, lawsuits forced the company to begin to control its emissions. Now, most of the sulfur dioxide is removed from the smoke and turned into elephant brand fertilizer. Where 
once almost nothing grew, virtually all of the varieties of plants are staging a comeback. But for generation after generation of workers, conditions in the plant have been more important than the condition of the outside environment. For example, lead poisoning, or being leaded, as it's called here, has always been a source of fear and a fact of life. In the early days, you know, the smelter workers believed that if you could keep your bowels open, you weren't as susceptible to lead poisoning. So they used to have a big wooden barrel in any convenient spot. And this barrel was filled with water and spiked with ginger. And these damn fools would be drinking this by the mug full and just <laughs> shitting all over the place, I guess. <laughs> Didn't help it. Guys got leaded. I started in 1946 as a carpenter. And there hasn't been too much of a change, except, uh, you know, we don't work as hard now. we still got lots of dirt, lots of gas. They promise, you know, they install a fan here or they start one up that's been dormant for years. But really nothing ever changes. The guys still get leaded. And it doesn't matter how you clean up. At the end of the day, you're just as dirty. Your hands are full of grime and lead dust. You know, since 1946, I haven't seen that kind of improvement that's worthy of note. Changing times have placed personnel manager Jim Gray in the sometimes uncomfortable position of being the middleman between management and labor. We have a rather mammoth campaign underway, uh, mammoth in terms of logistics and money to try and improve our plants as quickly as possible. They've been here for a long time. They serve as well. We don't work in a candy factory. It's a heavy industry. It's uh, old equipment, and it's sometimes dirty and uncomfortable. In my recollection, we've only had to pay one case of compensation for an industrial disease in terms of lead, leading or lead poisoning, as they call it. We have our own consultant that's on the premises full time. He monitors these people constantly. Before they even get anywhere near the danger point, they're moved to other work so that they're not exposed to this hazard. Now, this is the only solution we've had to the problem up to this time. Now, we recognize that that may not always be a permanent solution, and uh, our research scientists and our engineers are working on the possibility of new types of smelling processes that which will eliminate these emissions. Until that time, we'll continue, of course, to improve ventilation, improve working conditions. We get down to Union Hall one night, and the young guy was saying that he'd only been there a week, and the conditions were terrible, and the older guy was saying, well, wait a month, and uh, you'll get used to them. And the young guy says, oh, I don't want to wait a month. He says, I'm leaving tomorrow. For over half a century, there was virtually no union militancy in trail. But like everywhere else, the workforce has changed. Even the union is insecure. For two years, a raid by a nationalist Canadian union has had the steelworker membership split almost in two. Marv McLean's militancy is partly a response to the challenge from KMOS Doug Swanson. Well, if you take uh, the men who've been there for years and they start counting on their fingers the number of men they worked with that died of lung cancer in the lead refinery area and whatnot, you know, it just seems a bit too much. And they don't need to have the pollution measured when you can see it in the air. And all the pollution is directly related to greed. Greed on the Kaminko's part, because the furnaces are good for so many tons. If you put so many extra tons in them, then they start fuming off, and the flues can't handle it, the fans don't handle it, and the men know that. What you really need is a union that says, the men have the power to say, that's good for 50 tons per shift, and I won't put any more in. Not too long ago, we had a worldwide reputation for being one of the most progressive companies in terms of employee hygiene, particularly in the area of lead refining. And all of a sudden, the thing has rolled over and we're not good enough anymore. And uh, I don't think that we've slipped that badly. I think it's what's happened is that the standards of society have changed. But it all takes time. And there's such a general impatience throughout society these days, and including our workforce, uh, 
that they're uh, they're not anxious to wait for us. Lead is not the only hazard here. In the zinc tank rooms, sulfuric acid mist can dissolve unprotected teeth and nose cartilage. The new union militancy has resulted in dozens of orders for changes from the Workmen's Compensation Board and the BC Factories branch. There have been fines as well. High turnover in the tank rooms prompted the development of this new technology. But like any city, change is slow and piecemeal. 19th century techniques and IBM 1800 computers coexist in neighboring plants. Labor relations have changed the most. Managers once lived their whole lives in trail. Now they move around the world to Kaminko's various operations. Often they were workers' sons or brothers. Today they don't know the men as well, and the men have changed. Young workers don't stay unless the money and the conditions are right. Their example is causing older workers to demand a new deal. Grievances have multiplied alarmingly. A wildcat strike shook the confidence of both union and management. Everyone has an opinion, but there is no clear consensus. The people, I think, really would like to uh, participate in not management decisions, but participate and feel part of the company and have some association, some belonging. This is a need of saying is the company policy that whatever they say is the way it has to be, and the working guy really is extremely stupid. Yeah, but why, the first thing they learn in Kamenko after three weeks is the hell with Kamenko paid is every two weeks. Now, that's the thing we've got to break, and I don't, I don't like it any more than uh, Kamenko like it. That's a fact, Keith. Sure, that's the attitude Kamenko projects. That's but why they, guys they've got that attitude. They've created this monster. Yeah, but it's sure, they've created it. That's what I'm but saying. But that's why the guys got that attitude. After two weeks here, they said, the hell with Kamenko and paydays every two weeks. Yeah, and they're going to have that man for 40 years. He's a bloody years. boss. They said, I'm going to give you a reprimand. You're five minutes late for lunch. Yeah, well, You know, or ridiculous. five minutes late. Yeah, well, that's what they're doing. Well, right I've seen some damn good kids come through there, and they'll be taught much tradesmen. And yet, I've seen it happen, it's Marvin, in six it. months' time. They're, they're not worth a shit. But what, what initiative does it show to the individual to, to have pride in his work when they give him an hour's work and he's to spread that all over an eight-hour period. Yeah, Maybe you don't have this in the trade that you're associated with, but in my trade, I do. That's yeah, the company's fault. Well, right. well, don't mean, you uh, think that they degrade the individual yeah, to a certain extent? Maybe the average tradesman up there almost gets time off. Every tradesman nearly gets some time off in the summer. And, and the average chef worker up there, he... It, he, he gets, gets time one, off when they give it to him. One, yeah, and then, and then they month. pulled the bullshit in the melting room where every other plant at Kamenko was getting block scheduling of holidays. In the melting room, the first line supervisor said, no, we're not going to do it that way. If you want to have your schedule on holidays, you've got to take days of leave and lose money. That's where the wildcat should have been. Well, that may be your opinion, but it certainly isn't my opinion. Like I said before, Marvin, and I told 2,000 members in that hall there that the whole thing was company is still living under the Master Servants Act, and they pulled this off not too long ago. Uh, that's when Cinderella worked under, you know. But uh, like I told them at that meeting there, I said uh, they would spend $100 million rather than put that one plumber on that job, because that's management and rights. They want their right, and they're that militant in their archaic attitudes towards the membership, and this is what won that wildcat. If we didn't we have that, that sure, we never won that reasons. wildcat. And the number one reason and we won, we the won whole that wildcat is because we've got a new government in. They never would have won that wildcat with the social credit government in. What I think we're trying to do is loosen ourselves up to develop different management structures. People want to take more responsibility. They want to know why they're doing things. They want more information about their jobs. Mind you, it is not going all smoothly. Uh, Managements are not homogeneous things. They're made up of a whole bunch of human beings. And changing us takes quite a while. Yeah, a young guy comes up there, and then they start giving him the old bullshit that they're going to let him decide which pile of shit he cleans up first. Uh, the young guy takes one look at both piles of shit, and he says, I'm not going not gonna to clean up either one. You know, that's... And then they can't understand. They shake their head, and they say, well, this, this guy, he's a long-haired hippie, and he's not going to uh, fit in with our team at all, but pretty soon they're not going to have any team left. And the old guy, he's starting to see that maybe all these years working in the shithole, maybe he was wrong. We recognized for quite a while, I think, that the old traditional styles are not getting results. And we must try for something new.
At one time, almost every son followed his father to work up the hill. The workforce was so stable, the company gave men gold medals after 40 years of service. Now turnover is so high and recruitment so difficult, the company has resorted in some cases to rehiring men who have retired. They say a man needs ties in Trail before he takes his job seriously. And Trail has plenty of ties. But where men once stayed for security, they stay for different reasons now. The Kootenays hold Joe Luke as much as anything. I just like to put my boots on and my cap and I'm gone. I don't like to be bothered. When you're in the Kootenays, you, you're probably one of the best countries there is anywhere. You know, I've traveled a lot. I'm a veteran of the last war. I was in Europe. And uh, when you get used to the Kootenays, it's damn hard to give it up easily. Now, the other thing is, uh, a lot of our guys half quit and come back. And it makes you think, you know. You know, you've got a big investment in your home and you've got your friends here. You see these guys coming back, and you, you think, well, when you look at it logically, wor working is no hell anywhere. And you're going to find some, something wrong no matter you get the best job in the world. You're going to find complaints. Of course, after you're, you're here for 10, 11 years, you begin to think of your pension rights, too. Working is no hell anywhere. And Trail is a beautiful town. It has some of the flavor of a European mountain village, complete with terrace gardens. The community is about 50% Italian, and that has a lot to do with it. Everyone says it's a great place to raise a family. In 1895, some of the first Italians came to Trail, and they rode back to their hometown, and they got their own relatives to come here. They married and they had their children, and their children remain here. They probably formed their society because uh, maybe they couldn't communicate with the rest of the town. I think Trail's a real friendly town, and it's a pretty clean town. The sense of community Al Tognati loves is easy to see at events like the annual Italian picnic. We belong to the brothers of Clomo Lodge, and there's a sister, so we have a do up there, eh? The family gets involved, and you get involved in the activity of the town, and you just get so tied to it that you can't move if you have your family here. <laughs> Thank you, pal. <laughs> no, no, they will grab one here. They will grab one on the, sure. on the race. <laughs> Our children are going to college, and there's actually, when they finish college, there's nothing really to come back to trail for, you know, because we have the, the Kaminko, and it's limited to maybe just mining circles, you know. And uh, most of the kids uh, move out. And I think there's uh, just different people come in, and it seems to be a little stranger town than it was before, but still friendly. Social clubs, service clubs, great sports programs for the kids all help to hold people in trail. But the changes affecting the company almost seem like a jinx. Nothing goes as smoothly as it used to. In the late 40s, one-third of the workforce refused to even join the first independent union until the company president asked them to. This time, the largest turnout in the union's history voted heavily to strike. A principal demand is more money. Trail used to be number one in the country in terms of average wages. Another is 30 and out at 55. Retirement at age 55 after 30 years service. The raid by the rival union was sparked by a mismanaged strike two years before. This time, the union executive can let nothing go wrong. They must come reasonably close to delivering on the major demands or face replacement by another union. The tensions show, even in the policy this committee. This is a chance to keep communications going. They know why they're going out on strike, because their bloody demands have not been met by that company, and that's why we're going out. If they want any further information, there's a telephone in this hall. They can come down to this hall. They have to come down to register anyway. 
Now, this mass meeting bullshit, the next mass meeting I want to go to is when we've got a hell of a good settlement in our hand and we can say, here it is, boys. We got a hell of a good settlement on it. When you get a big demonstration of 1,500 guys walking out of that rink, look, Mr. Kaminko sees, well, them guys are together, eh? Eh? And that means a we hell of a lot. All kinds of meetings. Eh? So I think it's just a, a waste of time. Don't have to be told that we're going on strike. We know it. And I have to agree with Brother Mechanic that this is a good example to Kaminko up there. If you see enough, if they see enough people walking out of that hall. Oh, no, okay, go ahead, Frank. Go ahead. Last speaker. I just, to, I just want to say one thing, brothers. Brother Chairman. We hammered at that company for years. And we hammered at them to get the old pensioners more money. But when the pensioners got out there and demonstrated, by Jesus, they come out, didn't they? And the pensioners got some. They knew who meant business. Thank you, Brother Chairman. Now, the motion is that we hold a meeting on Sunday night to inform the membership of what's going on. Sunday afternoon, all in favor. Again, it's voted down. Joe, if you want to get involved, get down the hall and help register. We, we're having about 200 guys a day well, come I'm through here. I'm involved in that deal, explaining things to guys. Yeah. You're not. You're down in the hall. Yeah, I'm working 16 hours a day, okay, too, so don't give me any I shit. I can work 16 hours a day up, too. Yeah. Now. Okay, anyway, I think it was the majority decision, Joe. You'll have to live with it. Hey, Joe, let's save our fighting for the company. Yeah, right. Let's leave here fighting the Kamenko, not fighting each other. Thanks for coming. Where, where are we? Okay, how many of us guys are here? Eh? 75, 100? How many guys are up the hill? Like the days of paternalistic management, the times when unions could be bossed by the executive have passed. The new executive stresses participation and involvement. It has to. As a result, when it comes, the strike takes on a life of its own. Where are you going, hard-working man? Where are you going to today? Where are you going? Working man, where are you going to today? Better get more guards on there, Lord. Better get more guards. Can I pull a bus through? This will be the longest strike in Trail's history. Money questions are important, but the emotional charge comes from dissatisfaction over labor relations. As never before, the workers want to increase their influence over the work in the plant and the life of the town. And we depend on these workers, you know, coming down. That's our livelihood, eh? And if they aren't working, it's got to affect us. If you were crossing the picket line, you've seen your picture in the paper saying, is your father one of these scabs, you know? And then have all the 68 pictures of the guy that can cross the picket line. See what their sons and daughters have to say about that. Dirty? Nice. But why are you letting cars go through the gate? Why are you letting cars? Cars. Cars. Cars, cars with uh, a wheel in front of them, and I don't know who's in them. First line supervisors. Well, why aren't we stopping them? Well, they're scabs. Why aren't we stopping them? Well, how can you stop them? There's not one boss that's come down So if you stop every one of them from crossing, then what's the Camingo going to do? Why are every one of them? This is the best strike they've ever had in trail, so don't knock it. You get out there and stop the car from going in, they'll bring the police up, they'll put an injunction on there, and they'll throw all of their pickets in jail. No, they will. They'll get injunction. The union executive has left little choice. The younger membership is pushing them hard. They feel they must demonstrate their own militancy by exercising their full rights to picket. They take a large group to the gate and circulate, talking to everyone, trying to convince them not to cross. It works reasonably well for a while. on the line sparks a brief flurry of anger. It settles down quickly, but Trail has tasted its first violence on the picket line in over half a century. Not too bad. Out you go. Out. Ah. 
I think most people look on a strike for what it is, as an honest difference of opinion and difference between the two parties trying to get together, and it's a legal thing that's built into the whole problem-solving procedure. This strike is extremely necessary right now in the transformation of this town from a company town, not just to a union town, maybe to a company union town. Like everywhere else in industrial society, living and working in trail have changed. Workers demanding more consultation and control have reduced the power of management and even the independence of their own union executives. Responsible people on both sides recognize the problem, but they cannot impose solutions on a situation they can't completely control or understand. The process of give and take, even of confrontation, must produce its own resolution. Where you go in company town, where you go in to today, where you go in company town, where you go in to today, where you go in company town, where you go in to today, where you go in company town, where you go in to today. Very good. 